Hello, everyone. I am honored to be given this opportunity to provide a short presentation to all of you, the RAs, the new RAs of 2021. Congratulations on your endeavors and being accepted as an RA at RIT. If you've already been an RA and you're a returner, congratulations. I know that you've worked really hard to get through this unique time in history. COVID times among us are crazy. And I want to congratulate all of you for getting through it successfully. My name is Alicia Allen, and I'm the Assistant Vice President of NTID's Office of Diversity and Inclusion here at NTID. I'm thrilled to be hosting this presentation, but one word of caution, <laughs> this week my daughter is home. Occasionally I might hear her banging on the door or some background noise and distraction. It's currently locked, but in the event that you hear anything, hear any noise, it might be my very wild and active four-year-old. <laughs> so bear with me if that occurs. I also wanted to take the time to thank Sean for contacting me and suggesting that I do this presentation. To get back to Sean, he asked if I wouldn't mind taking this opportunity to present to all of you, and I thought, absolutely. So a little bit of background about me before I start. I was an RIT student myself a very long time ago. <laughs> Perhaps when you were younger growing up, maybe not even in high school yet. I came into college in 1999. So a bit ago, <laughs> and I graduated in 2004. My second year of college, I became an RA, and I loved that job. I loved being an RA. I learned so much from my peers, from the other students around me. There was a lot of exposure and a lot of impacts that I endured. And honestly, it led me to my work in the psychology world. And at that time, my major was psychology. I got there and graduated in 2004 from RIT. Then I ended up going to Gallaudet University in Washington, D.C., where I received my master's and my Ph.D. in clinical psych. So I do have a very strong background in mental health and counseling deaf and hard of hearing individuals. And a lot of my presentation, I cheated a little bit, I'm going to be honest with you. <laughs> I was trying to get this ready and figuring out what I wanted to do. Um, and I realized it was just best to pull from the work that I already know. I've also spent a lot of time working with the BIPOC community Black, Indigenous, People of Color, which is what BIPOC stands for. Uh, in that population, I've worked very heavily with them and have a lot of familiarity. So my work in the clinical psych field ties in to a lot of how you can be impacted as an RA. As you grow your own professional career, as you grow as a person, as an RA, et cetera, et cetera, there's so much that you can take with you onto your career in the ways that I did. And so I'm here to talk to you a little bit about that today. As an RA, you have tons of responsibility, expectations. You have a very prominent role at RIT. And of course, I'm sure you all want to do well. One thing I remember about being an RA is everything was about relationships. And as I'm the assistant vice president now, what I'm realizing is that, again, relationships are crucial. How you connect with people and interact is so utterly important, especially as we carry skills through in our careers. You might already be aware of that one of the first primary expectations you have is being on the front line with the students, freshmen, returners, etc. RAs are typically the first people that students connect with. Later on, they figure out their own groups and find their peers and friends, but I think RAs are really the front line start of everything. 
I couldn't imagine not having a relationship with people on the floor or my boss or, you know, professors, et cetera, et cetera. We have relationships with everyone. And how you interact with those people speak a lot to who you are as a person. So now I'd like to focus a little bit on students. Think about it. When you are a student coming to a college campus for the first time, what are some of the priorities or some of perhaps the issues that the students might go through, especially when we consider a mental health perspective? When they come here, perhaps students are exploring their identity, perhaps they're homesick. I definitely remember my time as an RA. There were a lot of students who struggled with being homesick and missing home, so that's perfectly possible. <laughs> Conflicts with each other, their roommates, their peers, etc. The ability to negotiate and figure out the best strategies to live. Sometimes it's hard for individuals, but RAs can make that load a little bit easier. Often, one thing that we don't talk about is the cultural impact students experience in developing relationships in conflict resolution, the ability and willingness to do so, the ability to remain positive and get through the semester. I couldn't avoid the implications of individuals you'll come across from all walks of life, different backgrounds, different identities at play, etc. And I wanted to make sure I included that in this presentation. So before we get into this, I would love for you to look at this image and just think about a couple of things. First, in the middle, you'll want to write your name. And of course, if we were in person, this would be a completely different experience. But roll with me on this one. I'm going to show you an image. It's got a picture of a circle in the middle, a pretty large circle, with four smaller surrounding circles on the outer skirts. In the middle, You'll write your name. For example, I would write Alicia. And those surrounding circles, you'll want to fill in the identities that resonate with you. However you might identify who makes you who you are. For example, I'm a black woman. I'm a dog lover or a pet lover. <laughs> that It might be something I put in my boxes. Whatever resonates with you. You'll want to put your name in the middle of the larger circle. And then what comes up for you, fill those in in the smaller circles. So I'll give you a few minutes now just to think about it and go ahead and jot some of those thoughts down. Feel free, if you need to, to pause the video, take some more time to think about what you want to write, and go ahead and do so. I'll give you an idea of what a filled out web looks like. I did this maybe last year, summer, early fall. And just remember, we are ever growing and ever changing. Some identities stay with us, some morph, and that's okay. This can always be changing over time. All right, so as you can see, this is an example of one person with multiple identities, that person being me. I consider myself a foodie, I'm a mother, I'm black, I'm a cisgender female, I'm hard of hearing, I'm an academic, and just to clarify, HH, what I'm signing, uh, means hard of hearing. <laughs> I'm an academic, I'm a daughter, I'm an empath. And just within the last couple of years, I received my PhD which I'm still acclimating to. <laughs> Being called Dr. Allen is not something I'm used to yet, but it is an identity I'm trying to incorporate and feel is a real part of me. But the point of this is just to show that we're all comprised of many identities, many roles that make up who we are. Some of you might realize that you've got a lot of labels or a lot of identities, and that's normal. There's nothing wrong with that. Others may feel... They don't have as many or only a few are strong and stand out. 
or resonate with them, that's okay too. We're all different. We all identify differently. But the point is that we have a lot of intersecting identities and that's what makes us who we are. And it's important that we recognize people are comprised of many parts as individuals. And over time, we can change, transform, and shift. And when you think about your residents coming onto the floor for the very first time, keep in mind that every single resident is a cool, unique being of their own with a lot of parts and intersecting identities that make that person who they are. So if you're in person, not online, (laughs) we have a sense of belonging and togetherness. And I would ask you when we get a chance to be around each other again to share stories and to share with others your proud identities. When I became a mom four years ago, I was immensely proud of that moment. When I got my PhD, similarly, very proud of myself in that moment. I'm a black individual. My family history is something I'm very proud of as well as a black woman. And it's important for all of us to share our stories and our collective experiences. Think about the identities you listed. Sometimes they're painful. For example, as a hard of hearing person, I recognize my privilege to speak a little bit. I do have some hearing capability though not much. As I lose my hearing over time more and more, perhaps I'll identify by something different, but for many years I've identified as hard of hearing, and in some sense I feel a little stuck. I don't quite feel as though I fit in with the hearing world 100%, but I don't quite fit in with the deaf world 100%, and I feel like I tote the line very carefully. And so over the years, the deaf experience, the deaf identity, the deaf deaf culture, That's helped me balance out a bit with my label and what I feel as a strong identity, but oftentimes I have felt very isolated. As a black individual, of course, I don't really need to talk about what's going on because we all know we're living in a world with many disparities, black and brown people compared to their white counterparts. Uh, One perfect example of why I wear this Black Lives Matter sticker every day is to point out the various disparities we experience as a population in healthcare, in even the criminal justice system. Some people actually will go as far as to say the criminal legal system. They won't use the word justice in saying criminal justice system because many people feel that justice is lacking for black and brown individuals. And it does really depend on perspective, but that is one that is out there. And really, these are just some examples to keep in mind of where you can find pride in identity, but where the pain also resides. Sometimes I see my daughter suffer and I don't want that. And I'll do whatever I can to make it not be so. But it's so important to learn about everyone's individual identities, pros and cons included. And what's really important is to not stereotype people to the best of our ability. If I connect with someone, a special interest group of sorts or a special identity group, it's really important not to make assumptions, especially, you know, coming from the black experience. My experience is very different than another person who is also black or when we compare it to brown individuals. We should not ever make the assumption that everyone's experience is the same, and it is crucial that we do not stereotype and play off of those assumptions in our interactions. So you might be wondering, Alicia, what's the point of all this? (laughs) And Well, we have all of that I just spoke about. I'd also like to talk about the topic of intersectionality. Before we get too in-depth on that, uh, and I have seen a lot of different signs, this being one of them, this is another I've seen. I've also seen sort of conceptually accurate signs relating to identities uh, and typically oppressed identities. The oppression is endured, but people still come out prideful on top. 
And with multiple intersections and identities overlapping, one, two, some of them, all of them will and can have impacts depending on the situation. I found a really great comic that I thought you all might appreciate, and I think it's a great exhibitor of what intersectionality is. I'm going to share that with you right now. Got a striped triangle saying, this is Bob. And we've got another part of the image that says, Bob is a stripy blue triangle and should be proud. Sadly, some people do not like Bob. Bob faces oppression for being a triangle and for having stripes. So we can see here that he's oppressed both for being a triangle and for having stripes. Luckily, there are liberation groups, but they aren't intersectional. So they look like this. And then you've got an area of triangles, different colored triangles, and then you've got an area of different striped shapes. They don't talk to each other. In fact, they compete is at the bottom with some little text bubbles coming from the various shapes. Next image. Bob can't work out where to go. Am I more stripe or am I more triangle? Bob wishes that the triangles and stripes could work together. Smaller striped circle saying, oppression of one affects us all. And the little triangle saying, no liberation without equal representation. So the moral of the story is that intersectionality is the belief that oppressions are interlinked and cannot be solved alone. Oppressions are not isolated. Intersectionality now. I love that comic. I think it's great, uh, a great representation of intersectionality. So suppose you encounter a resident who identifies strongly as a black woman. Women are an oppressed group. Black individuals are often an oppressed group. And how we navigate that journey to success can sometimes be challenging. But what's important is to not isolate these identities, being black or being a woman, it's important to bring them together. We all have multiple identities or labels that we identify with or resonate with. And some of them can be oppressed groups or oppressed identities, and others may not be linked, but it's important to keep an eye out for those that are. So because of that, I really encourage you to practice something called cultural humility. And cultural humility as a concept basically means, for example, when you meet a resident or when you meet a new friend or when you meet a classmate in class, you already know that you're going to face individuals that are different than you. You will meet people who have varying experiences who have differing backgrounds from you. And sometimes there's discomfort in that. And sometimes people can feel fear or perhaps curiosity that motivates them to learn more about the individual. And as an RA, a person in this role, it's incredibly important that you're very aware of who you are as an individual, your biases, your likes, your dislikes, and I would even encourage you during this time in college, which I think is the perfect time, uh, forming who you are, your identity, um, perhaps considering belief structures you grew up with, what fits, what doesn't, um, the knowledge you want to learn, and the intel you want to have. Um, this is the time. And I encourage you to take this time of, in your life over the next few years or in your you know three to five year program and be introspective. Assess who you truly are at your core. What are your standards, your values, and your beliefs? Because honestly, all of that influences how you interact with varying people from various backgrounds. 
So to navigate this journey and help others with their navigation, it's really important to practice cultural humility. Before I get a little more into this idea of cultural humility, I want to bring into perspective a framework I used in my therapeutic work. There was a framework called orientation. They follow a framework and use that framework to then orient with their patient, if you will, um, a certain approach. And basically, it's important for the clinician or for anyone really in this situation who meets a new person and interacts with someone new, it's important to check themselves, understand your belief system and understand others' belief systems and see how they interact with each other. It's really important to remove yourself from the situation and try to understand another person's perspective from their shoes. With that, you can learn better approaches and better avenues for interacting successfully with individuals. And so this is uh, related to the multicultural orientation, this, this framework I'm talking about, MCO for short. And really, MCO basically says, uh, and don't mind me, I'm just reading the PowerPoint here, but uh, worldviews, values, beliefs of myself and of someone else to try to understand that. And again, this is a therapeutic approach typically in the context of practitioner and client, but this can really relate to anyone. Uh, myself meeting a new person I've never met before, you meeting a resident or your boss or a new friend, anytime you come into contact with another individual. Your worldviews, your values, your beliefs of that person and of yourself mingle. And how does that happen? What does it look like? They coexist together. It's important to be aware of the influences that can happen during the interaction. Both of your ideas coming together and coexisting together in these new experiences and these new relationships. Information sharing can oftentimes promote healing, especially if you come at it from that lens. So I strongly advise you to encourage your residents to take on that kind of approach, this multicultural orientation, where we really come together and accept all people from all backgrounds. So how does one practice cultural humility? If I practice it, what does it look like? First, it requires you to be really introspective and incredibly honest with yourself. You have to look back and reflect on your experiences. For example, if you're of a strong religious background, does your religion accept other perspectives? And if not, that might be okay, but it's just really important to understand the religious component and how in that context certain things are not acceptable. Maybe you can hold on to that idea or belief, but you can still remain open to different ideas and different thoughts, even if it goes against what you think. If you can allow yourself to sort of step outside yourself, put yourself in the other person's shoes and understand where they're coming from. And of course, that's not easy for all people. Some people are very, very strongly based in their religion and their faith, and that's okay. They just might encounter more challenges in practicing cultural humility with others. Part of the self-analysis or the introspective uh, nature of this work is to be involved, to see what people are doing, and not just get involved with people and organizations you already believe in, but to really see what's out there and try to understand different ways of life. The more you learn and the more you're open to receiving that information and accepting it, the more easily you can practice cultural humility. Valuing others is a key component to this practice as well. In ways of valuing others, we're curious. We are open to learning from other people. For example, your residents, your colleagues, think about what you can learn from them as well as what they can learn from you. We respond from a place of rawness and authenticity. You know, sometimes people might be a bit hesitant to ask something, 
but think about other people. Think about other cultures. Think about other ethnicities and backgrounds and experiences. What do you want to learn from that? It's important to understand that your life progresses the way that it does. And it's very different from other people's, but that doesn't make it bad. And so how can we look at everyone's experience as authentic and equitable in that way? Another important thing I think that is a bit difficult for us <laughs> is honestly to admit that we have ignorance. Everyone has it. <laughs> it's okay to not know about everything. Sometimes people might not know a lot about deaf or hard of hearing individuals or, you know, in the same way I might not know how people stay up all night playing video games. <laughs> but if I'm curious about that and I'm wondering about that, I might ask someone, well, what does that life look like for you? Help me understand what you value from that. Help me understand how I can better support you. That's the place you want to come from is what do people want to see from you and how do you want the relationship to progress and improve? When we talk with the BIPOC population, it's important to consider that they're a minority population. I don't typically like to use the word minority in sort of this hierarchical sense, but in this context... The BIPOC population deals with a lot of things, a lot of barriers and frustrations, discrimination in trying to obtain employment, oppression for various reasons, systemic oppression that's deeply rooted in white Euro-American centric ways. Often people are not very sensitive to BIPOC individuals and their journey and the various challenges that they endure. And so it's really important to understand that when you meet someone who's different than you or who isn't, quote unquote, your typical white male or woman, perhaps you're used to seeing. It's really important that you don't put the responsibility on the BIPOC individual to teach you about their cultural or ethnic background. Let me give you an example. Asking someone to teach you about racism as a concept, for example, I might avoid that <laughs> versus asking someone something along the lines of, tell me more about this. I understand that racism is a big problem and I'm hearing that it's systemically based and can you tell me more about it, right? So coming from a place on, of authenticity, what do you want to learn about the other person? In this way, it's not about you. It's not about the other person teaching you and informing you and getting you up to speed, but it's really about people understanding the resources that are out there, people wanting to learn about this, and not just from the people that are hurting, but on their own. And if you want to have a strong relationship with BIPOC people, empathy is absolutely crucial. Again, understanding people's perspectives and, and walking a day in their shoes is the best way to practice cultural humility. One final thought I'd like to share with all of you is that cultural humility is a process. <laughs> it's an arduous process. It's difficult. <laughs> it's challenging, but fun. Sometimes it's challenging. It's hard to understand different ways of life. And sometimes it's rewarding in the way that you can learn. It might challenge your beliefs, but I hope that it helps you consider ways to modify your beliefs and also give yourself permission and grace to change your mind. If we all thought the same without growth and we never changed in our lives, where would we be? So please do give yourself permission to change. It's everything and it's okay. We only live once and it's important to make the best of it. When you have these cultural conversations with your residents, do expect discomfort. It is normal. And the more you have these challenging conversations and the more you can practice cultural humility and understand people's perspectives and their frame of reference, the more you sit in the discomfort, the more comfortable it indeed will be. And it's important to sit with those thoughts. Think about why you're feeling the way you are and think about the MCO framework. My beliefs, my ideas, my values, worldviews, ways of living, how does it interact with another person? How does it interact with people from different backgrounds? Try to come to some mutual grounding, some place of healing, some place of progress, and consider what you want to adapt and adopt. 
to further along this process. Sometimes you have to put your feelings aside. Your way of living and being might need to be put off to the side or the back burner for a moment to understand someone else's perspective. Now, you might be asking, okay, Alicia, which this is my sign name, by the way, a smile. <laughs> Alicia, what is the point of this, right? <laughs> First, we start with a discussion and building relationships. And then you talked about understanding different identities and different ways of life and how to interact successfully with people and how oppression affects identity. And now you're ending with how to become culturally competent and practice cultural humility. Well, now is the time. If you're asking why, it's because with all of the chaos, for a lack of a better word, this is the time to act and this is the time to relate. It's January 13th right now, and we know the awful, horrific events that happened in the Capitol building last week. We also know the elections are not too far in our past. Black Lives Matter over the summer. And all of the timely things occurring right now. One of the absolute best tools that has helped me get through this time and helped others and myself work better with individuals and practice cultural humility is trying to understand difference. And if you can understand difference, it can lead you to have a plethora of tools to help promote justice for individuals. You can become an advocate. You can be a great ally. And those are the kinds of people we need in the world right now to improve things and make them better. We need allies, people who are here by us. I would also love for you to keep in mind that there are a few ways um, becoming culturally humble. One is you have to combat your fear. <laughs> fear has no place in this work. Uh, it's there but it, we have to find a way to subside it. We have to find a way to move through the world and understand that everyone is unique and beautiful and part of life is beautiful confusion and <laughs> understanding different worldviews and seeing different perspectives. And there can be fear in that, but it's really important to accept and understand the implications of entering a conversation like this. It's really important to get rid of preconceived notions before you enter in conversations and relationships with people that are different from you. So just consider that. Try to be fearless in this work. Try to be prepared for the emotions that can come up. They can definitely surprise you and we don't always have control. Things can be triggering. It can be challenging to understand. Sometimes speaking with different people or oppressed groups they experience so much, so many traumatic events. And sometimes conversations can become very emotional because of that. And it's important to be prepared and ready to pivot and to handle that. It's important to just sit and be present. Sometimes that's all that's needed. And students, not only with cultural conversations, but talking about other traumatic events such as deaths in the family or financial regression because of COVID or mental illness, perhaps becoming depressed or developing anxiety in, amid these COVID times. We don't have all the answers to all of the COVID problems right now. The vaccine is on its way and it's here. We're getting it out to people, but we don't have a perfect solution for this. So sometimes just being there, being present, and being willing to listen is what's most important for a person. You can't always offer a solution. There might not always be action to be taken, but presence is powerful. And sometimes it's all one needs. With all of this information... I just want you to consider your journey, particularly with the RA role. I wish all of you the best in your future endeavors. I wish you the best of luck with your career goals here at RIT and your academic goals. I wish you the best in interacting with your residents and students. And if any of you would like to contact me for any reason, please don't be afraid <laughs> to get in touch with me. We can meet via Zoom, 
make an appointment if you would like it to be in person one-on-one. Please do just contact my assistant. Also, there's information on all of our social media pages and our website if you'd like to take a look. Really quickly, I'll go ahead and pull that up right now for you so you have an idea of what it looks like. So please feel free to contact me at any time at ntiddiversity at rit.edu. We also have a website with a plethora of resources and material. For example, Dr. Kendi's How to Be an Anti-Racist and other various resources on people of color, indigenous nations, and etc. So please do peruse at your leisure if you have time. That's www.rit.edu slash NTID slash diversity. We also have our social media pages. Thank you so much for your time. Go forward and practice cultural humility, and you'll be good for life if you do so. Thank you so much.